Welcome, everybody. Super excited to have you here. As you remember, we do our webinars Wednesday night. Um, tonight, we have a really special topic, and we have a special guest. Normally, he's in the back reading contracts, but Jonathan, we dusted him off, and he's here today to help us uh, learn about our legal structure, so and different things that you could do. So if we want to start sharing, we're ready to get rolling. Thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. This is our Wednesday Massive Masters Wednesday case study. So we're going to get right into it. That way we have plenty of time at the end for some Q&A. So educational series, even though we do have a professional on the call today, we always say that we're not professionals, um, but he is not your lawyer. So you need to get your own personalized legal advice. Um, you always want to make sure that you have a mixture of professional advice to make sure that you're doing everything correctly before you set up any structures or make any investments, make sure that you have the correct information because everything is personalized. There's not a one size fits all. So we do have a bus tour. It was supposed to be this Saturday, but maybe a few of you heard that Houston had a little bit of trouble. So we, we didn't want to go through the floodwaters on the bus and so decided there's still a lot of folks. I know several on our team just got power. I think there's a couple that don't have power. I've got several friends there that don't have power. Luckily, um, it doesn't seem like it was catastrophic, but it's uh, definitely challenging for a city. Uh, to be able to go through that. So the bus tour is going to pick back up again in August. We will send you more information and this is in Houston um, in combination with uh, some partners that we're doing this with. So we're going to talk a little bit about massive capital, the massive value add investors and partners. We're going to actually talk about entity structures, not deal structures. Sorry about that. And again, there'll be plenty of time for Q&A. So a little bit about Massive Capital, integrated real estate company, owner operator of value add multifamily assets. We're also a developer of triple net retail town centers, um, mostly in the Texas market. Those are the areas you can see where we are very Texas centric, but we do have assets in Denver, North Carolina and Georgia. We have looked at several assets on the triple net side in Tampa and Phoenix, but we haven't done anything in those spaces yet. On the left, you can see that we're LP equity fund, triple net brokerage, again, on the retail commercial space, property management, the same thing, land development, triple net construction. And for those of you that have been living under a rock and haven't heard, we have our massive masters and uh, we're actually going to have Maria is going to be talking about it tonight. So another, we got like two guests of honors. It's amazing tonight. And so down here at the bottom, you'll see that between the two companies, we have just over 500 million in assets. I don't know if anybody changed that just so I could say we have half a billion, but uh, we're, we're really getting close. Um, we've got a lot of things going on, super excited to be able to grow. So this is some information about our program here. So if you can see 22 and 23, we did 15 closings. And then if you go up to the top, we have closed our deal in San Antonio. So here's offering. We do have a couple of spots left. We have a property. It's a 506B. So you must have a relationship with us. So if you do reach out, this one is in West Texas. We are also under contract with 60,000 square feet retail in Houston. Again, a 506B offering. And actually, LOI accepted in the middle of a hurricane. We actually signed the contract. So uh, it's pretty cool. Um, and uh, luckily, the property, no damage, you know, anything is super exciting. Uh, so we're going to be giving out a lot of information. Right now, all of those three new deals are 506Bs. So if you would like to talk with Massive Capital, make sure that you book a call with one of our folks here. And you want to make sure, because if... It is a 506B and you don't know about it, you can't invest in it. So you must have an existing relationship with us. So here's the link, book a call. And I hear I went and sent the massive masters into the waiting room. So nobody there watched, saw that one, did they? So awesome. Unless there was somebody in the waiting room, but awesome, very good. Next one, please. So secret, we have projects coming. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about the massive value add group learning by actually doing, as I mentioned, Maria. Thank you. Help us out. Thank you so much, Trevor. I love talking about all of these tools that we get to use here at Massive Capital and kind of how we got started at multifamily. So we have multifamily and new development. And in that sector, we can have a limited partner or an LP investor, a lead co-sponsor or general partner, or we can have a JV type of deal. So there's lots of different structures that can happen in any traditional multifamily or new development deal. But traditionally, as most of our deals are that we showcase here, some of the case studies that you see on these Wednesday calls, you'll see our syndications, which typically are between our limited partners and our general partners. And we do have these awesome tech stacks. So when we are underwriting all of these deals, we are using a lot of software. There's software called Power BI. There's software called CoStar. I know you've heard of these before, but it's how we are comparing a lot of data and a lot of different numbers, properties, just making sure that we are bringing the best type of numbers and deals to our investors. I mean, we do comb through a lot of deals. We're in we're in July right now. I think we've, I, I don't want to over, over exaggerate. I think we've underwritten close to a thousand deals already. And if we're underwriting all those deals, how are we, how are we keeping them together? We're using Red IQ, we're using Monday.com, we're using all of these different, these different tools to make sure that we're really keeping all of that data together. Sometimes deals don't go through, but we gotta make sure if we've done all of those analytics on them, they might come up again. And if you've done all that work, you never know when you might be doing those deals. So it's always good to be utilizing those tools in our tech stack. But when we're raising capital, so if you go to the next slide, Oh, we're still we're still talking about equity partnerships. Okay. Keep clicking through, Jonathan. All right. So we have some real estate partnerships um, at Massive Capital. We do, there's a lot of different groups when it comes to our deals. We have acquisitions and deal sourcing, and that's when we're underwriting, getting our deals to PSA. So that's utilizing all that tech stack that I was just talking about. That's when we're getting deals under contract, like Trevor was talking about how we did that in the middle of a hurricane, which is kind of something to check off the bucket list. Pretty excited about that one. But when you're acquiring properties, and you're doing due diligence, you're doing the contract to close, that's part of the acquisition phase. Uh, the next phase of the property is that equity and debt. And that's the part that is, I think is it's pretty difficult. You know, you're, you're looking at the balance sheet, you're getting the experience, you're getting the loans put together, you're starting to raise the equity, you're getting those loans, you're getting those investors, you're starting to bring the deal together. Without that money, without the loans, without the balance sheets, we can't bring these deals to life. We can't close on these deals. So the debt and the equity is super important to bring those deals from acquisition phase into actually closing those properties. And then the part that takes the longest is asset management. I mean, so the first two steps take about, you know, a couple months, and then we go into asset management, which takes, you know, anywhere from three to five years that we're holding these properties, sometimes even more. So you have to have the right team for each of these sections. And if it's one person or if it's one person doing all of that, that's a lot of work. It's a lot that you're trying to put together. And that's why we want to really put together a team so that not one person or a one or three people are doing all of this by themselves. It does take time and it is very difficult, which is why we like to make sure we have a lot of people doing it together. Thanks, Jonathan. Go to the next slide, please. So we are always looking to grow together. So here at Massive, we've got our land um, acquisitions, we've got retail development, and that's more like a done for you type of service. We've got multifamily, which is the GP, the the actual multifamily properties more like the the apartment complexes and those are new acquisitions those are the debt the loan guarantors and then we have massive masters which is our education program at massive masters we 
try to do things together. We try to have a hand-holding experience where we can work with you to help you take down those deals. Like I was talking about deal flow and equity raising and managing those assets. It's, it's a hard thing to do. And to take that on by yourself is not an easy task. So that's what we do at Massive Capital. And that's what Massive Capital is all about is by working those deals together with you. We are underwriting deals four days a week together. We are equity raising constantly together and we are managing these assets together. And that's the main thing is we're doing it together side by side with you. You're doing it with us. We're doing it right alongside with you. So that's the point of being a part of Massive Masters. If you've ever wanted to join a team, this is the time to do it. And this is the group that you wanna be a part of. We've been through all of these programs. We've done other 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 mentorship programs and we've brought together what we feel like is the best the best of the best and that's what we wanted to bring to you that's what we really like in massive masters it has a bunch of tools the tools that we were talking about earlier we have a crm tool which is called client harbor it's where you really can focus on your investors and making sure that your investors you're getting to know them you can track them and making sure that you can communicate with them effectively so thank you. And if you have any questions, uh, Brenda and Trevor and I are here and Mike as well are here to talk more about Massive Masters. If you have any questions, we'd love to continue to talk about it. Um, book a call with us because we'd love to talk more about it. So thank you. All right, I'll take over from here. Um, so generally when we're talking about uh, entity or company types that are, are available to people, we've got, uh, you know, the basic structure, which is just a sole, pr sole proprietorship. Um, you know, it's a single individual running their business under their own name or a trade name, um, you know, Bob Snack Shop, uh, which is just, you know, just running as, as an individual. The next level up would be a partnership. Uh, it's an informal uh, or it's a, it's a formal agreement between uh, multiple individuals as partners. Uh, it is not an entity that is recognized, so to speak, that requires filing with the Secretary of State. It is a contractual relationship between two uh, business partners uh, coming to general coming together for a common uh, endeavor. Next step above that is, uh, from an entity standpoint, is a limited partnership that does typically require a filing with the Secretary of State. Uh, it's a little bit more complex, but it's also the basis on which we get a lot of our terminology where you have general partners and limited partners. So limited partners are, the, uh, in, are typically investors. Um, or silent partners, so-called silent partners who are along for the ride, but the deal is being run, the, the partnership is being run by the general partners. Um, but that is, like I said, that is a, a specific entity type of structure as a limited partnership. The next step above that is uh, what is most typically used in our environment, which is the limited liability company or LLC. Again, that requires a Secretary of State filing. Uh, and, and I'm gonna focus the most on this because it's the most relevant. In this context, in the context of multifamily investments or real estate investments where we're using syndications, we're typically using two LLCs, uh, the holding entity and the uh, manager entity. We borrow a lot of the terminology from the limited partnership structure and incorporate it into that syndication structure where we have the limited partners, which are the uh, equity investors. And then we have the general partners, which is generally the management team. And how that gets structured, I'll, we have a, a slide that I'll get into uh, a little bit later. Um, but the LLC consists of members um, where we have the, the limited partner members and then we have the general partner members. Um, next above that, we've got the corporation. Uh, which is very typically very rarely used for real estate. And the, the reason is, is because of the, the tax uh, penalties. I'm not going to get into it. It's, it's more of a issue. Uh, you know, if, if you have an accountant that's recommending a corporate st uh, structure, there may be uh, compelling reasons to do it in the context of real estate investing and syndications, corporations are not used. 
Um, and likewise, uh, just because it's out there, a, a nonprofit corporation typically regarded as a tax exempt entity, a charitable organization or an educational uh, uh, entity, uh, again, not used for ownership of real estate in the context of syndications and whatnot. Uh, the next slide we've got, and I just went through this, um, you know, we've got the sole proprietorship. One of the main uh, problems with the sole proprietorship is that it creates a, a situation where you have unlimited liability for the owner of the business. If that entity gets, or if that business gets sued, that is a personal liability that's going to attach to that individual. Uh, that individual's assets will be uh, at risk to uh, pay off any liabilities or secure a judgment that may be obtained against that business. Um, partnership, same scenario. Uh, unlimited liability for the individual member that created the liability. Um, and so typically a partnership is not used in that context as well. Uh, limited partnership uh, Similar situation, although the liability does not extend to the limited partners, which makes it a little bit more appealing. Um, but generally, if you're working in a limited partnership, you're dealing with a higher level entity structure overall and a more sophisticated transaction. So, and in the context of uh, real estate syndications, we'll use uh, limited partnerships for the uh, if we're bringing in an equity, a, a higher level equity partner, bringing in a large amount of money. Um, but typically not used in the syndication level directly. Uh, with the LLC, one of the, or the most appealing aspect of it is that it creates a uh, liability shield for the members where individual members' uh, it, personal assets are not at risk for the liabilities created by the LLC. That exists in the context of both the limited partners uh, or uh, the, the equity investors, but it also exists from the standpoint of the general partners or the management team operating uh, the property. And so the LLC is generally very appealing in this context uh, because of the uh, limited liability uh, protections that exist, the liability protections that exist. The other key factor that makes LLCs very appealing is that they can be they can be run in a relatively informal manner. And what I mean by that is that there is not a requirement for formal meetings, formal votes, formal uh, the, the formal events that typically are associated with a corporate entity uh, existing under uh, state law. So there's no requirement for annual meetings. There's no requirement for any meetings at all. Now, does that mean that you don't conduct them? No, but it means that your corporate status is not affected by the failure to conduct those meetings. When we're operating as, as the syndication entity entities, we are definitely conducting meetings. Um, those meetings are occurring on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis, uh, depending on you know, what, the, what the type of meeting is. Those meetings are occurring, but if we did not have them, we're not at risk of losing our corporate status, our, our uh, liability protections. Whereas in a corporation, if you are not conducting your annual meetings, your, your shareholder meetings, you are at risk of losing your corporate status. And that's a bad thing overall, because without the corporate status, you lose your liability protections. Uh, the nonprofit corporation it, it typically, like I said, exists. It's a tax exempt filing, or I'm sorry, tax exempt entity where the um, it, it's not generating profits that are distributed out to members or shareholders. It is simply uh, those ask, those uh, any revenue that's generated is just basically turned back into the company for uh, continuing operations. Um, the next issue, uh, I've covered the first two columns there, the business structure, the owner, and the liability structure. The tax structure is, is the next factor that comes into play. And I will recommend, uh, Trevor mentioned this when we started, uh, you know, consult with legal counsel. Um, I do a lot of entity formation uh, as a private attorney. Um, that conversation will usually, in all cases, uh, involve discussions with the accountant as well, because the accountant understands what the tax goals are of the, of the entity. Um, and so it is crucial that 
when you're setting up an entity that you are getting guidance from your accountant as to what is the best scenario, because a lot of times that will override the liability issues that are involved as to what is the better scenario. So sole proprietorship um, from the standpoint of taxation is, is actually really simple because it shows up on your personal taxes only. There's no entity filing um, and all of the income flows through at the personal level for the individual on their filing of their 1040 uh, federal tax return. Partnership returns are a little bit different there is a, uh, or, or the partnership structure is a little bit different because there is a partnership return, a, ten, a form 1065 um, that gets filed uh, with the IRS. Uh, however, the benefit is that the income flows through to the individuals at the, in, uh, the personal tax level. So they'll get a K-1 from the partnership that flows through and the income is reported on their individual taxes. But the, the entity itself, the partnership does have a tax filing uh, obligation. The LLC may or may not have a tax filing obligation. If it is, if it is a multi-member LLC and taxed as either a partnership or a corporation, which it can elect to do, then it would be filed, then it would be filing the appropriate entity return for what it elects to be classified as. So if it elects to be classified as a partnership, it's going to file a 1065. If it elects to be taxed as a corporation, it's going to file a corporation tax return. In most situations, most individuals will set up an LLC. If it, or uh, let me step back, if it's a single member LLC, there is no tax filing requirement at the entity level. Everything flows through to the individual, and the and the entity is considered a disregarded entity for tax purposes, and the uh, profit and loss is uh, shown on the. Um, on, the, on the individual's uh, tax return. Uh, when you are doing the, uh, if it's a multi-member LLC taxed as a partnership, which is the most common scenario, uh, again, it's gonna get a K-1 that is then going to be reported on the individual's individual uh, income tax return. The corporate entity, uh, we've, got two sh uh, we've got three shown here, the CB and the S Corp. Uh, the C Corporation is your conventional corporation uh, with, uh, you know, shareholders, it's typically used for larger corporate structures, um, that will have its own corporate tax that will be paid at the corporate level. The S Corp, however, is a slightly different, uh, entity because you can, and a, a corporation becomes an S Corp by electing to be treated as an S Corp, uh, which means that it becomes taxed at the individual shareholder level. It does not have a entity level tax. It will, uh, the taxes are paid at the individual level. I will caution that those are high level uh, entity structures that are typically only utilized when your accountant, your CPA advises to do that. Um, it is it, it, in the context of real estate, it's corp, S corps, uh, C corps are typically not used. Um, particularly in the context of the syndication world. Um, there, there's reasons for that that go beyond our structure. If your accountant is saying use an S-Corp, by all means, you may, you know, that may be the correct advice. Um, but again, that is generally a unique uh, individual by individual basis that uh, goes beyond the scope of what we are, are, would cover here. Um, corporation, uh, nonprofit corporations, tax exempt. Again, uh, there are uh, filing requirements, but there's no tax, uh, no entity level tax. Um, all right, moving on. The formation process, and this is important because it does take some time. And it also takes some uh, understanding of what each individual state requires. So in most situations, we're dealing with an entity filing uh, articles of organization or certificate of organization filed at the Secretary of State for the state in which the entity is being formed. Uh, in our context, we will typically do, and this is because of the way the lenders require the deals to be structured, we will have a holding company the holding company LLC will be uh, incorporated in um, the state in which the real estate is owned. So if you have a Texas asset, we are filing with the Tex Texas Secretary of State as a domestic LLC. Uh, all the filings go through the Texas Secretary of State. 
If we have a manager entity, which we usually do, uh, that can be up for discussion. Um, oftentimes we are using a Delaware LLC uh, at the request of the lender, um, but that does require a filing in Delaware. Uh, alternatively, you can use, if we're, if we're buying a Texas asset, you can utilize a Texas LLC for the manager entity. Um, and that really depends on you know, what your lender is requiring. There, there are preferences that lenders have to use Delaware uh, because of Delaware's um, statutory scheme for limited liability companies and corporations, et cetera. Um, but it's uh, states are, or lenders are, are getting away from that requirement as a hard and fast rule. It used to be that it was always a requirement that you had Delaware involved in the, in the transaction. It is not necessarily a hard and fast rule at this time. When you are setting up, uh, filing your articles of organization or certificate of organization, um, you're going to designate the name of the entity, the, ad the relevant address for it. You're going to be picking a registered agent. The registered agent is the individual or entity that is the official uh, recipient of any legal process that needs to be served on the entity, as well as any official notifications that need to come from the Secretary of State. Uh, for annual filing updates or forfeiture uh, paperwork, et cetera. Um, you can use a third party registered agent. There are companies called registered agents um, that will serve as your registered agent. The benefit of that is that it creates some anonymity in the filing so that uh, you know, your individual name does not appear on the filing. Uh, that varies from states to states. Um, Delaware, it, it's very easy to have some anonymity. Uh, Wyoming, there's the ability to have some anonymity, but other states don't allow that uh, level of anonymity and actually want one of the members or the shareholders uh, listed on the filings. Um, so you, then you, step four, you file your paperwork. Uh, step five is request your tax ID number. That can be done directly through the IRS. Um, if you're utilizing a law firm to set up the entities uh, and proceed with the formation of the entities, which is something that I do recommend, um, typically the law firm will obtain the tax ID number. But if you're going this solo, again, I don't recommend it, um, you can obtain your tax ID number directly from the IRS. In no circumstance do you need to pay a third party. If you're doing it yourself, you don't need to pay a third party to get that tax ID number. You can file it yourself. Um, next step is, uh, we should throw in another step in there, uh, which is forming the, the entity operating agreements. Um, so while you're filling out your incorporation papers, uh, getting your tax ID number, legal counsel should be drafting the operating agreement, which is the formal agreement between the members as to their rights and obligations, liabilities, and duties with respect to the operations of the LLC. Once the entity is formed, um, you will need to open a bank account. And most banks require at the very least cop certified copies of the filing with the Secretary of State's office. Some state, some banks will require copies of the operating agreement. Um, in, in this context, all, any lender will require it, but to open the bank account, they don't necessarily require the operating agreement. Uh, agreement itself. And then step seven is the commencement of business once, uh, you know, in terms of uh, purchasing the property, uh, getting the loans in place, etc. This is the structure that we use on the vast majority of our syndications where we have, um, and it just lays out the relevant members of the entity uh, who's involved and their relationship with one another. So at the very top, we've got the property. This was used on the Horizon apartment uh, complex that we acquired in San Antonio. Uh, you'll see that we have the ownership entity, which is Horizon SATX Holdings. SATX is abbreviation for San Antonio. Um, it is a Texas LLC uh, we, because, it's a, uh, because the asset itself is located in Texas, we needed to use a Texas LLC. If you don't uh, use it, if you if you elect to use, for example, a Delaware LLC as the holding company, you will need to file also for uh, 
a, a foreign registration in Texas. So in this, if we had used, if the ownership entity was a Delaware entity, we would have had to file in Texas also as to register that foreign Delaware entity as a, um, as a foreign business authorized to do business in Texas. Uh, somewhat redundant, uh, you know, it's a, it's an extra level of filing. Uh, can can As these filings add up, it starts to get to be uh, uh, rather burdensome uh, to keep track of where the filings are located. Um, but in any event, you know, we used a, a Texas entity for the ownership entity. And that ownership entity has, in most situations, we'll have uh, two classes. Um, on the upper right, we've got the class A1. Uh, members, which are the limited liability, limited partners, again, borrowing from the limited partnership language, um, but we use a, a class A1 member for the limited partners. And then uh, we have a class B membership, which is the GP team, the general partnership team, which is the management team. In between there, you'll see on horizon, we have a class A3 um, that can just be a separate uh, class of investors that are uh, either receiving a preferred rate of return or have invested at a, at a higher level and we've decided to create a, a separate class. But in oft often cases, we're just dealing with the class A and class B uh, membership interests. Below the ownership ent entity, you'll see that we've got the manager entity. That's the entity that operates the ownership entity. Uh, it is comprised of the general partnership team. It does not have limited partners as its members. It is purely a single member or single class of members uh, coming together to form that entity to op to manage the the asset. In this context, we've got two members that are involved in that in that uh, in that entity. We've got Massive Realty Group, and then we have our co-sponsor, which in the context of uh, Horizon was TVG. Um, GP LL, uh, GP2 LLC, which was a Texas uh, entity. You'll notice that in between the ownership entity and the manager entity, we have a, a line that shows non-member manager. And that is done to isolate the manager entity from the ownership entity so that there is no direct ownership there. Um, so the, the manager entity does not have any direct ownership interest in the holding company uh, entity. That is done for liability protection. Um, however, you'll see that the class B members of the ownership entity mirror the membership interests of the manager entity. And that's where the, uh, the profits when there are additional profits above and beyond what is distributed to the LP members, those profits are distributed out to the class B member or the GP team. All right. Um, that was a fairly quick overview of the entity structures. Um, one of the things I want to point out, and, and which is also part of this discussion, is that what asset there is no requirement if you are investing in a deal as an LP, as a limited partner, there's no requirement that you form an entity. A lot of individuals do. Uh, we have entities coming in as LP investors, um, either as LL single member LLCs. We have multi-member LLCs. We have sole proprietors, individuals. Forget the sole proprietor because it's, it's not necessarily a business. Um, but individuals investing in their own name. We have trusts that are being utilized for investment to, to own their the LP shares in the entity in the asset. Um, oftentimes, it's a uh, revocable uh, family trust or what's known as a living trust. Sometimes it can be an irrevocable trust. Um, again, that's getting into the trust dis discussion. But there's no requirement that you form an entity or have an entity to invest in an LP. Most of our investors actually are uh, individual on the individual level. And then I would say that the next level is on the uh, IRA, uh, self-directed IRA level where, where we're using a, a, a third party uh, IRA company to be the member in the entity, in the asset itself. Um, that being said, there are, you know, if you were to consult with uh, your tax advisor, they may recommend based on your unique situation 
that you utilize an entity for your investments. And that will be guided by your CPA as well as uh, conjunction with the attorney that would be likely drafting the documents for you. So I think that concludes my presentation. Um, we maybe want to check the chat and see whether we've got some questions. Next question is, if, if you have a big capital gains, what are the advantages of using foundations? And I know that could be more of a tax question than a structure question. What do you mean by foundations? Um, can, can you uh, unmute yourself and say what you mean? Yeah, uh, yeah just, just like uh, like charitable, like nonprofit uh, foundations. Uh, I've heard you can uh, like put your capital, like put your money in without, uh, like you're, you'll be only subject to like maybe a 1.4% capital gains tax if you put your money your gains into a foundation that's kind of what i was and then you have like a five percent rule that you'd have to donate uh your value uh once a year something like that i just wasn't sure if all the details behind it but those are the kind of main topics i've i've heard yeah okay so that that is a higher level uh tax entity structure set up for tax purposes only. My recommendation would be that that's a conversation that you have with your CPA and with your attorney, both of whom need to be familiar with that structure. Um, the reason is, is because the risks associated with doing it wrong um, are not real good. Um, and so it would be best to make sure that you do have the best guidance on it. Um, I would not necessarily recommend doing that without getting, you know, higher level input from the CPA uh, on that issue. And we do have a tax one on the 31st, Wednesday the 31st, and our accountant uh, will be here for that particular one. So um, he might know some way to advise a little differently. One of the things, too, I wanted to make sure that was clear here, if you're looking to be a passive investor, you can still invest into a syndication just as an individual, correct? Um, because it's already, you, you have no liabilities, you have no risk. The only risk you have is your investment. So there are no necessarily advantages in forming an LLC unless you want to be able to start expensing things through those LLCs. So if you have passive investments that are generating some income, you may want to you know, write off your accounts. You may want to write off your lawyers. You may want to write off a business in your house, a portion of your home. Um, and then having an LLC allows you to do that. Correct, Jonathan? And then it you, does. Pass, yep. you pass the difference through to yourself directly as income yep. and, and but it has expenses as well so yeah two things two things i want to comment on that one is um, the liability issue so the syndication provides the liability shield for the investors so if and i'll pick up an awful scenario let's say an apartment building burns down there's going to be lawsuits um particularly if, if somebody dies all right so somebody dies their estate brings a lawsuit against the uh, the holding company and the management team, you as an LP investor are protected by that syndication structure right off the bat. You do not need any additional liability shield in, within, in the form of either a corporation or an LLC to protect your personal assets from liability resulting from that devastating loss. Okay, so that's, that's the big issue there. Um, there are reasons to do an entity if you want to, like what Trevor was just saying, where you want to be able to expense certain items. I personally like utilizing LLCs as an organizational tool. Um, so whatever software you're using, um, it, it keeps your, and one of the important things with, with LLCs is you keep your, your business books separate from your personal books and books i'm talking about your accounting um your your banking your accounting how you're keeping your records so when you have an llc 
you are keeping separate books. They are not the same. You're not utilizing the same checkbook that you buy your groceries out of or checking account that you buy your groceries out of. You're keeping separate accounts so that you can very easily look to see what are business expenses, what are business uh, expenses that you want to be able to uh, write off or um, uh, or expenses that you want to be able to uh, capital uh, capital acquisitions that you want to be able to depreciate. So that's one of the reasons why I like utilizing LLCs is just from an organizational standpoint. Um, again, you can do that at the individual level. It's just not as, it, it, it tends to get very muddy with your own personal finances when you're, when you, when you try to do it as a, um, as an individual at the individual level. Perfect. Thank you. Any, any other questions that people have? I hope this was clear, helpful. It can get a bit complicated. I would also caution, don't go crazy with LLCs. Um, I, in the past, entities were set up for, you know, if you're investing in, let's say, single family homes, um, uh, you know, it, and in the past, it was common to utilize an LLC for every property. Um, states have realized that the that there's uh, benefits to be obtained with people setting up multiple LLCs, and that it ends up with you know administrative costs that may or may not be necessary. So um, you know, a lot of times you'll have pass through entity taxes. You, you you've got uh, filing fees on a on an annual basis. You've got if you're using a registered agent, you've got registered agent fees. All of those add up if you're using multiple LLCs. So I would caution against always setting up an LLC for each individual asset. There are people that will say that you know you can put up to about five million dollars of assets into a particular. Uh, LLC before it may be appropriate to move on to another one. The, the biggest factor, and, and this is outside the scope of the discussion, but realistically, properties are, are protected by insurance. All right. I, I would not necessarily want to rely solely on an LLC to protect your own individual assets. Have the insurance in place to protect that property. Make sure that that insurance is in place in sufficient amount to protect the asset uh, and the entity. And then also have for your own benefit an umbrella policy for any liability that may potentially pass through that entity. But insurance is cheap. In the long run, insurance is cheap. Um, and so if you can utilize uh, adequate insurance for each asset and lump those assets into multiple into a single LLC, that's generally the best way to proceed rather than you know creating an administrative nightmare with your, for multiple uh, LLCs. Perfect. Thank you. And then someone asked the question, why would their CPA recommend to invest through an LOC rather than individually? Um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not sure why. <laughs> um, um, very rarely. It, I mean, it depends on the nature of the business, but in, in the context of real estate, I can't envision a situation. Um, it, it, I'm assuming we're talking about investing on an on a, in an LL or in as an LP. Um, so you're coming in as a limited partner into an in investment. I unless you have other investments that you are pooling together into that individual LLC, I can't see a reason if this is if this is your only LP investment, I can't see a reason that an L, that an invest that a CPA would strongly recommend the LLC. They they may encourage you to do it, but I can't say that they would strongly recommend it. If you have multiple LP investments, a lot of times it's easier for them to just do it in a in a single LLC. Um, it, it in the context of syndications where the liability protection is is already built into the system um, th there is no added benefit to forming the llc so that that uh issue is really a non-issue it really comes down to bookkeeping um from the standpoint of the cpa with multiple lp investments Uh, let's see. How do you manage multiple LP investments with your IRA? 
Um, so IRA is kind of like a different identity, right? And yes. you can have different types of IRAs. So I have self-directed IRAs. Some people have solo 401ks. Each of those are kind of like an entity, correct? They're individual investments, but the IRA itself, I mean, it, let's limit this to self-directed IRAs because you're not using a regular IRA to invest in most situations into these, into these, uh, into a syndication. So if you're using a self-directed IRA, that account, let's say it has half a million dollars in it, 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 it you can have that half million invested in multiple uh, syndications. You can have it in, you know, five syndications, a hundred thousand dollars in each. Um, that really should just be regarded as a separate account within that, that overall IRA account. Um, it, much like if you had a fidelity account with ownership of stock in IBM and, uh, Tesla and Apple, uh, it's just a different holding. Um, but it, it really is not, so it's not you would you would not have any problem doing multiple LP investments under a self-directed IRA. And Meg, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? And on the umbrella insurance, you know, again, if you're just a passive investor, your risk is very low. If your LLC has other things that may, you know, in other words, you may have an automobile in it, or you may have some other things in it that could cause liability, then that would increase your risk. But if it, right. you're just using an LLC as a passive investment, um, you know, I don't know how necessary it is to insure it. That Correct. Again, that, I'm not yeah. an insurer or an accountant or a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, that would that wouldn't dictate getting an umbrella policy. But if you've got multiple um, single family investments in, in an LLC, uh, I would strongly encourage an umbrella policy. And that's a discussion to have with your insurance broker. Yeah. Uh, myself, personally, I have a personal umbrella policy because most of my entities are pass through entities. So I have an umbrella policy on myself personally on um, part of my, you know, um, you know, just in case something happened, you know, one of my kids, you know, or I got an act, anything happened. Um, I personally had one on myself. And, and, you know, you structuring just like anything, there's lots of free advice out there. There's lots of people that will tell you to do something. I've had it where I've set up a whole structure and then met with a different accountant, a different attorney. And they said, why did you set up that structure? You should have set up this structure. Um, so again, make sure that you get educated. Make sure that you have providers that you know, like, and trust, just like with investing, you're looking at syndicators and then get the information that works best for yourself. Um, and it doesn't mean depending on where you go. So if you're just a passive investor, you can keep things simple. For myself, I'm a little more complicated. So I have one company that I use for my passive investments. I have one company that owns my GP shares. And I have one company that collects my asset acquisition and asset management or any fees out of it. Um, and again, it's just the way I've structured myself and I have some reasons for doing that. You know, my goal is, is that eventually my acquisition fees and then I can start doing self-directed 401 solo, 401k solos and start, you know, there's, there's reasons for it. Doesn't mean it's right or wrong. Um, you know, and I had one attorney tell me I needed a Texas LLC and another one said, you're crazy, you need a Wyoming LLC. Um, so now I have one of each, trying to close down the one I don't use. Education is always key, and that's our goal on these Wednesday webinars to help you navigate and answer questions. Any other questions? Did we, did we? Hopefully, you guys learned something today. See some folks come back that I haven't seen in a while. Nice to see you up here. 
it's always good to have Maria here and a special treat to have Jonathan here. So I'm going to see Jonathan in September. I'm actually going to a meetup up in Denver. So I'm out to Denver. Know? Yes. Anybody in the Denver area? We're going to be up there. We're going to do a tour of our properties. I've never seen them. So remember, we're here every Wednesday. If you learned something, enjoy it yourself. I want to see you back here next Wednesday with a friend. Um, oh, I did not pop into the chat too. You have to make sure that your ladies on the call have signed up for she. Um, and next Tuesday, they have Vina Jetty. If you don't know Vina, Vina is amazing. We appreciate everybody showing up tonight. Wow, we're done right at seven. Are you sure there's no questions? All right. Thanks, everybody, for showing up, spending your Wednesday evening with us. As always, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Take care.